the very first Christian sermon ever preached is in Acts chapter 2. Peter, Pentecost, thousands of Jews have come to Jerusalem to celebrate, and he has the audacity to get up and say, you people killed God's Messiah. He was God's son. You put him on the cross, but God raised him from the dead to prove that he was the Messiah. The crowd was thunderstruck, and they realized in that moment, oh my goodness, we we killed the author of life, we're doomed. And they asked the question, is there anything, anything we can do to be saved? And Peter, in these immortal words of Acts 2.38 said, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. What an unbelievable gift. In fact, it's been so important that baptism has been a part of every church for all of church history. Now, different denominations and backgrounds will practice baptism at different times and in different ways. And so that raises a couple of questions that I want to answer for you the best I can from the Bible. Look, I'm not trying to be critical of any church or any, any person. I just want to answer these two common questions to the best of my ability. Question number one, what is the right way to be baptized. Because a lot of people have been sprinkled as infants uh, or as, have been baptized long after their faith in Jesus Christ uh, just to kind of join a church or maybe make some commitment to a group. What is the right way to be baptized? Well, it, it, when you ask it that way, it sounds contentious. And again, I don't want to be critical of anybody. But the definition of the Greek word baptize, you want to you know the Greek? baptizo. <laughs> Clearly, we did not translate the word, we transliterated the letters. If you translated it, it would sound like this, dip, immerse, wash, or dunk. That's what the word means. But I don't get my, my practice of baptism from a mere word definition. Rather, I get it from a theological truth, Romans chapter 6. We are baptized into the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. That makes so much sense to me. You see, if we're going to begin our discipleship journey, discipleship is simply following Jesus, doing what he did. Why not begin with a reenactment of the importance of his life, death, and resurrection? So we begin by saying, Jesus, I'm yours, and I will imitate you. Whatever you did, I'm going to do. And Jesus began his own ministry with baptism, didn't he? In fact, it was so important that the Trinity showed up. God spoke, the Spirit came in the form of a dove, and Jesus, dripping wet, began to preach the gospel. So it seems to me critical, since it began Jesus' ministry, and the very last thing Jesus ever said on earth was this great commission to go and make disciples, baptizing them. So if it was his first act in ministry and his final words on earth, it seems pretty important to me. It's so important that some have asked, do I have to be baptized to be saved? <laughs> I don't like the way that question's asked. Because you're asking me, okay, so uh, what do I, do I have to receive the gift that God has given me? Do I have to receive it? Hello? Yes, God is giving you a gift. Now, let's be clear. Let's be clear. No act, whether baptism, Bible reading, go to church, no act earns your salvation. But it is pretty clear. Uh, you go through the book of Acts. Why were people baptized and when were they baptized? in their initial faith in Jesus Christ as a statement that they're giving their lives to Jesus as he gave his life for us. Now, I, I, you are not saved through baptism. You are saved the millisecond the Holy Spirit embeds himself on you. The Bible calls that the seal of the Holy Spirit. Can God seal you without baptism? He's God. Yeah, he can do whatever he wants with your mortal soul for all eternity. But let me tell you why I think it's so helpful that God gives us a gift of baptism and why every Christian should receive this gift of baptism. A lot of people at their conversion, at the moment of faith, they're led in what's called the sinner's prayer. I know I'm a sinner, I give my life and I receive yours in me, something like that. The problem with that, it was a couple of problems with that. One is, it's never in the Bible. Never in the Bible is there a sinner's prayer. No one ever prayed to receive Christ. Uh, in faith. And when we do, it's easy to forget the words that we say. I think baptism is the sinner's prayer. 
It's an enacted prayer without words. And if your family is not a believer and you get baptized, they will come to your baptism and without you saying a word, you will preach a perfect sermon for them to hear. Because it's all about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, you living a new life and following after him. And because it involves your entire body, sight, sound, touch, it is far more memorable. And God knows this. We have short memories, especially through periods of pain. And in your darkest hours, your strongest memory of your baptism will be a marker to remind you who you are and the commitment that you've made. Look, this is not to be critical of anyone, but it is an offer from God to receive a gift, to let Jesus be your Lord, and for you to confess that publicly for all to see that your life is now hidden in Christ. 